Hi, my name is Kelvin Guest of Guest Wines, and welcome to our Wine and Dine with Collins Catering. Collins Catering have prepared three delicious dishes, and we have selected three wonderful wines that we think not only go well by themselves, but work perfectly with the dishes that Collins Catering have provided. So before we go any further, can I please check that we have the following wines with us. We have the Cutting Cuvée Noble number no. two, the Painted Wolf Den Pinotage, and the Quinto de Portal Fine Ruby Port. Fantastic. These are to be served alongside the following dishes, which is the smoked terrine salmon, the braised belly pork, and the white chocolate and raspberry cheesecake. Fabulous indeed. Right, now we're ready to begin. And before we dig in, now would be a good time to say a little bit how to taste wine, as well as food and wine matching itself. So tasting wine, the difference between that and drinking wine, which I'm sure you're all very adept at, is that it's all about just taking a step back and paying attention to what it is you're actually experiencing in your glass. Now, if all you smell and taste is wine, then fine, that's a really good start. However, to identify some of the other aromas and flavours that you might be experiencing in that glass, it just takes a little bit of practice. It's all about your brain registering these flavours and, and aromas that generally are found elsewhere. To say like, for example, if you are presented with a, uh, an apple or a, a raspberry, for example, your brain through experience will already have some idea of what that's going to taste and smell like. Whereas if that aroma and flavour is in a glass of wine, it could be a little difficult for your brain to pick that up because it's out of context from where it usually expects to find those tastes and uh, uh, aromas. So how, how, how we do the taste of the wine, it's all to do with something here in the top of your head, it's called the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb here has got, uh, it's connected to your emotions and your memory and it's listed all the good, the bad and the ugly of all the flavours and aromas you've experienced over a lifetime. Some will be more preferable to you and some will be not so. There'll be ones that will be more familiar and again some that are not so. And from here this is where you've developed your own sort of personal taste of what you like uh, in, your, uh, in, your, in your foods, in your wines and interest drinking in, in general. Now uh, to taste wine, which I'll show you here, you can all have a go yourselves at home, is it's, it's important not to fill your glass right up to the top because if you do that it'll when we're going to do a bit of swirling in a, in a moment, it will just end up tipping over yourself or over people next to me, which is one enough to, to drink it. And in, in any glass of wine, you don't want it going any further than above the uh, curve here on the glass. It, it just maybe it looks nice. It enables the aromas to open up in the wine, so you be able, so you can capture more of those wonderful uh, tastes and, and smells that are going on in the glass. Too full it won't allow that release uh, of that to happen and uh, the wine won't be uh, as pleasant. So wine tasting is a very subjective uh, experience. There's no exact science to it. Obviously it's all down to our own personal tastes, our own personalities, uh, our own genetics of, of what we taste and experience in wine. So therefore a way in which we can begin to convey what it is as individuals are experiencing in a glass of wine uh, as a system has been developed called the systematic approach to tasting. And the systematic approach to tasting is used in professional wine events and also in tastings such as this and it just helps us to have some kind of structure uh, of how to taste wines and then for each and every one of us to, to have, a, have a good chance of being able to understand what it is that person is talking about when they're expressing uh, their whatever it is that uh, is uh, find the finding enjoyable in that glass of wine. So this basically is a system where you're, you're looking at the wine, you're sniffing the wine, you're tasting the wine, and from that you make a conclusion. The main conclusion you really want from the wine is, do you want another glass of it? Is it enjoyable? Do you want more? And that's kind of what you're looking at. So the first bit is you're going to be looking at uh, the colour of wine, because it's all about the, how attractive something looks, how nice something looks. Now, more or less, nearly all wines are made to be uh, clear, uh, as I mean, and not cloudy. There is some wines that go to the natural wines manner that are deliberately made to be cloudy, but most wines are not. And particularly with white wines, it's all about the look, how they look to the customer, how attractive they are 
for somebody to want to drink them. White wines in general, as they are, the younger they are, the generally the more paler they tend to be, and as they age, they become darker. Red wines, on the other hand, tend to be very dark when they're young, and then they start to fade and become paler as they become older. Um, the wine we have here has got some quite a little bit of colour on it. This is down to the, the grape varieties and, and the time it's possibly spent uh, on its actual skins. White wines are made off the skins. They usually, they, they, you get the grape from the vineyard, you, you, you crush the grape, you get the juice and then you ferment the juice. But in, but in some aspects, sometimes winemakers want a little bit more flavour, a little bit more colour. So they leave the actual grapes with the skins on the juice for a little bit of time. This is called maceration and this allows more, more flavours to uh, uh, begin to develop and a little bit more colour. And this is what's been done here. And, and the word noble here is with this great, with this uh, wine here, it not just refers to these being classic grape varieties from the Alsace region, but it also uh, relates to some of the grapes here have been left on the vine for a long time so they've become very, very ripe. And this has enabled them to then impart more concentrated flavours and also possibly a little bit of the colour that we find in the glasses. This is a nice bright golden colour. So we'll give it a swirl and next we're going to give it a sniff. So give it a sniff is so just like you know so can you smell? No. If it all you can smell is wine, don't worry, that's fine. If it's nice smell of wine and you want to drink, you want to get, want to know more about it and drink more of it, then that's fine. So what I'm smelling here in the glass. That's one of the things like spicy, it's got a very spicy side to it. Almost like there's a bit of ginger or something going on. Uh, really bright pear, uh, maybe even a little bit of a um, sort of tropical fruits in the background in there as well. But nothing overpowering. It's, it's nice, it's subtle, uh, it's got a nice textural uh, uh, sensation to it just on the nose, the aroma nose sort of gives you this kind of uh, impression of ripeness, of richness, that it's going to have this, this, this wonderful silky palette to go with it. So the next step is to uh, taste the wine. Now tasting the wine is different from drinking the wine. Drinking the wine, just pop it in your mouth, swallow it, job done. Taste the wine, you've got to leave it in your mouth for a little while, and then you've got to begin to sort of unravel what it is, your, your not only the, the flavours, uh, that you, you're getting, but also the way the, it feels in your mouth. It's called a mouthfeel. This is the things like textures, the weight. I, I, is it silky or is it oily or is it light? Is it zippy? Uh, all these things are all uh, build together to, to uh, the overall um, pleasurable sensation that you're getting from the actual wine itself. So to do this, I'll show you first, then you have a go yourself. And it, all I can say is probably the first of it, it's a bit like whistling backwards. So you get the wine, don't put too much in, because too much in, sometimes the alcohol may tickle the back of your throat and that'll make you want to cough. And if anybody's sat in front of you or anywhere around you, they're not gonna be happy uh, with the result. So just, just bear with that. Uh, so here we go. Over to you guys. Let's hear some slurping and sniffing. So, as you're doing that, what you should be experiencing now, apart from it being a little bit embarrassing, is that the wine itself is opening up, it's accentuating it, the volume has turned up on the actual flavours that you're now experiencing. So, some of those, what you were getting on the nose, the right pear, maybe some of the tropical fruits, or a bit of peachiness, or some of the spiciness, you can actually feel um, um, the, scent, the uh, sorry, the taste uh, in in your in your mouth. These become more apparent, and they're also lifted by this lovely uh, uh, fresh acidity that zips through there. But there is a weight, there's a richness, there's an opulence to the to the body of this wine uh, that that. That uh, I suppose it, it gives uh, that uh, um, more uh, credit to the uh, ripe fruits. It, it brings them to the fore. It gives you that richness that these fruits uh, not only smell and taste like, but you can actually feel that richness with the weight on your palate. It's really lovely. This is this is uh, made from uh, two uh, very traditional grapes from Alsace, which is uh, Riesling. 50% and 50% Pinot Gris. Now Pinot Gris is also known by Pinot Grigio 
if it comes from uh, Italy. Pinot Grigio for Italy tends to be uh, a more on the lighter style, but whereas Pinot Gris, in particular from places like Alsace, it, 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 the grapes are usually left to hang longer on the vine, and so you get this more richer style of fruit. And I just think this is a, a, a fantastic uh, wine uh, uh, to begin with. Now, just before we move on to uh, looking at the other wines, I think this is an important uh, time then to look at uh, what the, the food and wine. Again, a bit like um, wine tasting. There's no exact science to this. It is a very uh, subjective experience. What one person may find is a perfect match, other people may not. So some of the wines that, you know, we, we, we feel that the wines that we've uh, uh, suggested for you this evening work particularly well. And this is because, not because uh, um, there's, there's, there's that exact science to it, but because um, there is certain elements to wines and to, to foods that when they combine together do seem to work better than when uh, uh, they contrast. Uh, and these kind of things like maybe like talking about acidity, if you've got an acidic food and you've got an acidic wine, your first impression is, well, that's just going to be double acidity and it's not going to be very nice. But when you actually uh, uh, combine them together, the acidity becomes much plusher, it becomes smoother, it becomes nicer. And, and, and this is in the food, the texture of the food and the texture of the wines both complement each other. Now, if you've got an acidic dish and you've got a low acidity wine, that wine will just taste flat. If, however, you've got a very tannic wine, and the tannic wines generally tend to be red wines, and the tannic is that thing that dries your mouth and numbs your gums and puts a lot of people off drinking red wines. But if you drink that red wine on its own, it can taste pretty astringent and, and, and not very pleasant. You don't really want to drink lots of it. However, if you then uh, combine that uh, tannic wine with a food, particularly food that's got protein and or a little bit of salt, that these tannins suddenly become very soft and juicy and luscious and, it, and, and then the fruits of the wine sort of lift the actual whole dish and it becomes a fantastic combination. And equally, uh, um, uh, sweet dishes. Now, sweet uh, foods, sugar, the sugar in the food doesn't go very well with dry wines because the dry wines, the acidity clashes with the sugar. However, if you match your sweet dish with a... Uh, a wine that's sweet or sweeter than the dish those together work perfectly well now people again maybe like the the, the acidity uh, example think oh that'd be just too sweet to be too sweet this overload but it doesn't they work really well it combines and it makes it just it accentuates all the flavors in the dish but also in the wine as well and the, and the and the sugary side you don't really begin to sort of taste it as standing out it all just works complementary and equally sweet wines and sweet dish uh, the sweet wines uh, work well with salty dishes as well because the salt if anybody's had uh, 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 chocolate caramel you'll know how perfect these work together and it's equally the same with with um uh sweet wines that you had you get you get a sweet dessert wine you had it with a bit of a salty dish something like a, a stilton cheese for example is, is a great example they just work fantastically well together so Without further ado, I think we should move on to uh, telling a little bit about the wines that we've selected for you this evening, just a little bit more. We'll go through them and I'll taste them with you. And then I will tell you why I think these wines go well with the dishes that uh, have been provided by Collins Catering. So the first wine, which I've now uh, got a nice glass of and I've told you a little bit about it, it's 50% Riesling and 50% Pinot Noir it's from the Alsace region in France. The Alsace is right in the northeast corner of France. Over time, it's been part of Germany, it's been part of France, of course, it's part of France. Um, but if you ever go there, the culture is very Germanic. The, the, the language, the, uh, the, the general culture, the food, the music, uh, the buildings, the architecture, and also the wines. The wines that they have are, are um, Germanic. Great varieties, uh, classic Germanic ones uh, such as Riesling, uh, Pinot Gris, uh, they have um, also out there Gewürz um, and also Pinot Blanc, etc. 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 Now, the wines are also served in a bottle that looks very ger Germanic in itself, and this, these wine bottles are called Flut, uh, and this gives a nod to its uh, German heritage as well. Uh, the uh, domain this is from, uh, is, this is a family domain, and they've been going since the 1720s. So there's a long history there of uh, winemaking uh, production throughout. Uh, and this sort of gives them a bit of credence to 
uh, know that this wine is of uh, uh, good quality. It's 30% alcohol, so it's got some nice weight and body to it, but it's also got that from the acidity from the Riesling. Riesling is known for its uh, natural high acidity. And this just gives it, cuts through that nice freshness and doesn't make the wine fat and flabby because of what this wine has got some weight and body to it. And like I said uh, earlier, that uh, some of this is due to uh, some of the grapes being left to hang uh, quite uh, some time on the vine. So they've got really, really ripe. And so that's what that does. It, it, it concentrates the sugars further and you get this nice sweetness and this uh, sense of uh, um, almost a sweetness in the wine, even though this is still a dry wine in itself. Um, and obviously I've spoke to what they, I think, uh, is a very spicy, tropical, bright fruit, some bright yellow fruits going on in there. And why I've chosen this to go with the uh, smoked salmon is because um, I think together, um, the Pinot Gris, because in itself that is a, a variety that's here providing some weight and body and texture, will combine with the weight, body and texture of the uh, smoked salmon. And um, together, they just give it this real lovely textural mouthfeel. And then you've got the acidity that goes through that, it cleanses uh, the palate and it gives it brings back a little bit of freshness and that gets you ready again for uh, the next mouthful and I hope you agree when you taste it please do okay right so we're going to now move on to uh, wine number two and this is your painted wolf the den pinotage this is from South Africa and uh, again, this is a small family operated um, wine estate and it's run by a gentleman called Jeremy Borg and his wife Emma. They're also very big into wildlife conservation. So there's a percentage of uh, the, the uh, uh, money that's paid for this wine goes towards uh, animal conservation, not just in, in Africa, but uh, various places uh, around the world. It's called Painted Wolf uh, because that is one of Jeremy's main uh, conservation concerns and this is the uh, Painted Dog that is uh, facing extinction in Africa and Jeremy is uh, working with part of a team to try and save it from uh, extinction. Uh, all the bottles have a, have a different artist each year to paint the labels and they're always these fantastically wonderful attractive uh, bottles that we see here. Pinotage itself, uh, it's a great variety that is uh, uh, found mainly in South Africa. It was developed in South Africa. It's got a bit of a potted history to itself. Um, it's a crossing between two French varieties, which is Pinot Noir and Sanso. And it was done uh, in order for a variety to be uh, developed that would uh, withstand the climate uh, in, in South Africa. And like I say, it's, it's had a potted history. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, initially uh, the wines that we developed weren't, they weren't much, well, they weren't, they weren't much good. And another contributing factor to that was there was a lot of vines at the time that had various uh, disease issues. And, and, and these together made the wines uh, not nice at all. And with wine critics, they just used to get slated, They're often referring to them as tasting of banana, uh, paint stripper, Etc. So things that you don't want your wine to necessarily be tasting of, but that's all been sorted out now, and it, they're no longer like that. And this wine is definitely not anything like that at all. So Pinotage, um, it used to be called, uh, referred to as Herbitage, because they wanted to try and I think the South Africans also wanted to try and uh, replicate a little bit the, the wines of uh, the Rhone Valley in, in France. And why we chose this to go with the uh, uh, the braised pork is that it's got this this wine has got I think all the perfect ingredients to go it's almost like giving it the wine the, the food a little bit more uh, of, a, of a sauce uh, to go with it um, which I will explain in a moment when, I, when we taste it so with red wines red wines 
are made with the skins. If you make a red wine, try and make a red wine without the skins, you will end up with a white wine because inside a red grape, it's, it, in general, they're mostly always like a white grape, they're kind of white inside. And if you, if you squeeze them, you'll get white juice and you'll have a white wine. So in order to make a red wine, you have to ferment the actual juice with the skins. Unlike the white wine we've just had where you actually press the skins away from uh, the juice. Um, so this one is what we term as a nice ruby colour. It's nice and bright. It's not, it's not totally uh, intensely concentrated, which is good because Pinot Noir, the, one of the grapes that it uh, derives from, is not either. Uh, and then when we stick it on the nose, we've got all these really lovely red berry flavours, saying things like raspberries, cranberry, and then we lead on to more spicy, earthy tones like dark chocolate, espresso coffee, there's a little bit of smoky barbecue going on there in the background, a whiff of it, and then a little bit of earth, and then suddenly all that nice raspberry fruits, the juicy raspberry fruits also then resurface. And then to taste it, mm. it's got a lovely freshness. The tannins, as I've said before, these are the ones that are dry mouth are there, but they're not too they're not too distracting. They're not where you just your mouth is just totally dry because the acidity that acidity brings back that freshness and stops that happening. So you get this nice fresh fruits come through. You get the fruits on there. The raspberries almost like hints of a little bit of raspberry jelly baby and some floral essences come through. Maybe a little bit of rose, uh, just an undercurrent of it. But there's this lovely sort of wave of smoke and coffee tones that go through. And I just think with something like the braised pork belly, are a perfect marriage. These work so well together. Now, um, the fruit, I just think really ripe, juicy fruits really work well with red meats. It, they both help each other to stand out, but not in a bad way. They don't make them stand out in an awkward way or, or, or show off one more than the other. I just think they both complement each other in a, in a, in a fantastic, uh, a fantastically nice way. But then the smoke and the spices, these just add to the actual flavours that you're getting actually in the dish. And then that nice acidity just washes through that and just keeps everything clean and fresh and nice. And then you're ready again to take more on with the food. And I hope that's what you're finding here. So I'm just going to have another taste of this because it's actually really nice. I'm just enjoying it. Mm. That's well better because if anybody out there is a Pinot Noir drinker, you will understand some of where the heritage of this wine comes from. See, Pinot Noir, you tend to get the lighter skin, you tend to get the raspberry fruits, a little bit of floral tones, this earthiness. Sometimes it can be, sometimes in some Pinot Noirs, it can be almost early on a farmy kind of um, 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 taste. But this one isn't, it's, there's that earth there, but the it's, where the Pinot Noir starts to sort of diverge away from its Pinot Noir, uh, sorry, its Pinot Noir starts to diverge away from its Pinot Noir heritage is that there's that savoury, spicy side to it. The side that's got that smokiness, the chocolate, the barbecue essence to it. And that's just, I just think it's a wonderful wine. And in summer, this is a wine where I would say I'd chill this down just a little bit, not too much. And it's perfect with your barbecue outside. It's just a wonderful, wonderful wine. Cheers. So, I'm now going to move on to our third wine, which is our Quinto de Portal Fine Ruby Port. Now, Quinto de Portal, like all the wines here, again, it's another family operated estate. Uh, they see themselves as what's called a boutique winery. What we mean by boutique winery is it's just, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's small. It's, it's about doing um, uh, limited batches of wine, uh, creating wines that are very well made. It's not about making lots of quantity for the sake of quantity. It's about having less, but what you get less of, you get more in its standard, in how it tastes, and its flavours, in the quality of the grapes that have been used, etc., etc. Now, port uh, is generally one of those things that we tend to think, just drink at Christmas. And, and don't. It's, it's, it's a, it, I think it's a fantastic uh, wine. 
that uh, often gets overlooked and we should just try it more often on different occasions there's an array of different kind of ports from your um, uh, white ports, pink ports, you've got your late bottle vintage, you've got vintage crusted and ruby that we've got here. The ruby ports are designed to be all about the fruit. Now to make a port it's called fortification and, and, to, and, and to do that you, you, you go away making a red wine much as we did with the uh, Painted Wolf Pinotage. Um, you, you, you ferment in the grapes, uh, red grapes and in this case it's stuff like uh, Tuiga Nacional, uh, Tuiga Franca, uh, Tinto Roris, these are kind of some of the grapes that are from the Douro Valley in Portugal and these uh, again they're fermented on the skins but uh, part way through the fermentation is that they halt that fermentation by adding in 77% uh, spirit and this spirit then stops the fermentation because it kills the yeast, the yeast can't cope with that amount of alcohol all in one go uh, and what that does is it brings the alcohol up uh, by volume into the bottle so around 20 percent i think this one's 19.5 generally most ports are around 20 uh, but it also preserves the sugar in there because it's the sugar that the yeast of eating to convert into alcohol if it was a dry wine it would eat all of these those sugars and then you'd get a dry wine of about 14 15 percent but here they've actually killed the yeast off so they haven't converted all the sugar into alcohol so you get a very alcoholic wine from the spirit but you also get a sweet wine from it as well but also it's about the fruit. So here, this has been aged for around three years in oak, but not small oak or new oak. It's been in very, very large uh, old oak barrels. And these oak barrels don't really impart any wood flavors at all. What they're there to do is they just allow little bits of oxygen to get into the wine. And this helps to mellow the wine out over those three years. And then it's popped in bottle. And it's all about the lovely fruits, the rich, rich fruit, laid there with, uh, I suppose they've done, laid, laid back with all this um, rich weight of a body that's partly through the rich fruits and also the amount of alcohol in, in there. Now we've paired this with the, uh, the uh, white chocolate uh, uh, cheesecake um, and we think it, I think it, it's, it's fantastic to go with it. Now just first, you're looking at it, it's a nice ruby, it's darker as you can probably see from the uh, Pinotage, but then you give it a, a swirl and a stiff, and now you're getting a really concentrated, ripe cherry. It's almost like a, it always reminds me of like something like a Black Forest Gatto or something like that. It's just got a wonderful chocolatey side, uh, dark plums, uh, a bit of maybe a bit of strawberry, particularly like tin strawberry going on in there. Lots and lots of lovely concentrated fruits with just that essence of that maybe a bit of chocolatey spice and then we'll taste it it's got some lovely weight all that mouth coating sticky fruits are all there and it's just wonderful it just bursts onto your palate and then you've got that nice, just a little bit of warming from the alcohol, but not too much. And there's enough acidity in this, and I think also the cheesecake, that level this out. And they not only cool down that uh, alcohol that's, that's in the glass, but they also lift the fruit in here. And it also accentuates the chocolate that, uh, that uh, is in the, the cheesecake. And I just think they make this wonderful marriage because both have got both the cheesecake and both the the, the, the the port itself have got some quite weight to it they've got some stickiness and they can uh, and, and this could all you can, you can imagine it could all just get a little bit too cloying but it doesn't because both the dish and the wine have got this acidity and it just freshens your palate so it's clean again i think you're ready for the next lot just pop it in pop it in a bar and it's, and it's great and the alcohol when it's sort of well crafted like this it doesn't stick out it just gives you that nice mellow warming feel and something like at the moment where it's a bit miserable outside a bit cold these are fantastic and again there's nothing wrong with having it just a little bit chilled not too much not like a white wine you don't want to freeze it down but just maybe sort of 15 20 minutes uh in in the in the fridge just let it cool down it's just fantastic because it just it just allows those fruits to come out and the acidity to be more apparent but not uh, um um uh, making the the alcohol in any way sort of stick out. Um, I'm just going to take another mouthful.
marvelous thing. This lifts the chocolate, the chocolatey essence you get in there, and the fruits combining just work so well together, making it just a wonderful marriage where you just want to eat more and more and more. Obviously, have another glass or two of it, but not too much more. Because <laughs> like I said, it is 19.5 alcohol in there. But, you know, all the merrier sometimes. So, they're the wines, and I hope you've enjoyed the food from Colleen's Catering. I just think they're uh, uh, fantastic dishes that they provide. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed uh, your uh, food and wine matching and, and, and uh, matching with us. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you there in person. I suppose this is uh, uh, circumstances dictate at the moment. Uh, but hopefully not so in the don't, not so distant future we'll all can get together and have a wine dinner and I can be there in person and you can all be there again in the same, uh, together in the same room and we can do uh, something similar again with more food and more wines to, for you to enjoy. If you're not already uh, on our newsletter, you can sign up to our newsletter at our website at www.guestwines.com. Please stay in touch with us. Uh, it's been fantastic uh, having you uh, uh, on board with our wine and dine. Hopefully you'll come and do many more with us. If you've got any suggestions or anything that you think we should be doing or you'd like to do with us, then please get in touch. Uh, we're always interested in doing anything from simple wine tastings to food and wine to looking at uh, particular wines from any particular region or wine styles then we're happy to do that with you as well. We can also do live Zoom as well as recorded Zoom as we're doing on this occasion. So thank you very much once again. Enjoy the rest of your wines and your food and I'd just like to say um, cheers and thank you. Cheers. <laughs>